It's in every one of us, you and I. It's in every one of us, you Thank you, Lissy. I was not aware that was a Muppet song. I, I, I know that it was written by David Pomerantz, but oh man, one of my favorites. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Actually, to start off this morning, I want to show you a short video, and this is uh, from Unity. So give me a second, and we'll get this rolling. This has been a challenging time for our Mother Earth. Floods, oil spills, earthquakes and wars, natural and man-made events that threaten life on our planet. Yet there is hope. Now more than ever, we are being called to hold our world in loving, healing consciousness, to pray for the awakening of humanity and the dawning of a new era of peace, health, and harmony on our planet. We are divine in creation, whole and holy, loved and loving. And as we lift our thoughts and prayers together, we create a powerful collective consciousness that influences the world around us. We open our hearts to spirit and together we manifest love and healing in our world. Let us affirm healing of our oceans and forests, the peaceful resolution of rifts among nations, full mental and physical health for all, health and well-being for all life in its many forms on the land, in the sea, and in the air. As we pray for our planet and all of her inhabitants, we feel gratitude for our many blessings and for the awakening of our world. With our hearts open to God's renewing love, we affirm and accept healing for ourselves and for our earth. Yes. Yes. We affirm healing and health for our planet, for our Earth, for each other. And we know that we are a part of helping to create that. And so really a big part of our coming together here on Sundays is so that we can really tune into and align our awareness and our energy and our consciousness in such a way that we are participating in the healing of Earth, of planet Earth, the healing that's going on in our world. It is happening. It's happening right now. And it's sometimes challenging for us to look at that and see that because that's not what we're often being presented, isn't it? We're often being presented, in many ways, what seems like the opposite of that. But as I've been thinking about this week and listening and, and praying about what lessons to share with you, I, I um, was really clearly guided to, to follow up on some of the things that I was talking about last week and then to come into another awareness of some of the, the symbolism that we find and that we see in the book of John and some of the, the stories and the parables of 
interestingly enough, parables of Jesus' life. You know, Jesus taught in parables. He, he, he told many stories. But one of the things that many people are not aware of is that Jesus' life itself is a parable. It is a story that is here to teach us and to share with us our own unfolding and awareness of how we can really become a part of exactly what we were talking about here and how we can move into that kind of awareness and that kind of energy and really learn to participate in life in a way that we are expressing more of the light that, that Lizzie, Lizzie was singing about, of our, our beautiful spiritual nature, of our divine essence. I, um, so I got an awareness this week, and, and the, the, the lesson title that came through for me was those wine, uh, water to wine moments. And I had no clue what that was going to be about until I really, <laughs> until I really, but I kept hearing that, and I'm going, okay, well, that's, that sounds like that's my lesson title. And then, of course, that is in the second chapter of John, and I was walk, talking about the first chapter of John last week, and so we're going to talk a little bit about moving into, from the first chapter of John into the second chapter of John, because there is a, there are spiritual principles and spiritual awarenesses and ideas that really do teach us ways that you and I can participate in the healing of our consciousness and in the very act of healing our consciousness and transforming our consciousness, we are participating and being a part of uplifting of the planet, uplifting of those around us, uplifting in our, our world. I uh, came across a, a really nice story about a lady who was working in the church office and one church and she, uh, <coughs> she noticed that you know, oftentimes that, that uh, when the coffee was made, someone would drink the last cup and then there would be no more coffee and they, you know, just would have an empty pot there. And so she, the secretary wanted to motivate her staff to, to be a little more considerate and responsible, so she, she taped a, a really neatly typed plea on the pot and it read, if Jesus drank the last cup of coffee, what would he have done? Go thou and do likewise. So the next morning she came in and found the coffee pot filled with wine. Yeah. <laughs> I like that one. I thought that was pretty cute. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there was a young boy, uh, there was a man at a uh, park bench and was just visiting and, and talking to different people. And there was a, a little lad about five years old sat down not far from him and was sitting and winding, um, was winding what appeared to be a really one of his, uh, like a most pr prized possession, which was his watch. And he was just, just and fascinated with it and was just spending a lot of time looking at it and winding it. And the man said, you know, that's, that's a really pretty watch you have there. And he said, does it, does it tell the time? And the boy said, oh, no, no, you have to look at it. <laughs> well, I thought about that. And oftentimes when we are looking, at, we, we need to look at things sometimes. They don't necessarily just pop out and tell us what's going on. And, and in unity, we look at our, our scriptures metaphysically. We look beyond just the, the essence of the facts or the story we look beyond that and recognize that there is something within all of these that are a part of our unfolding spiritual nature. That the, the stories of our scriptures really are our stories. They really are about our unfolding spiritual, psychic, um, uh, psychological, and emotional nature. And physical nature as well for that matter. So they really are talking about us in so many ways. And so I really began to look at the second chapter of John. Let me read to you. The third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and Jesus' mother was invited. And Jesus also was invited with his disciples to the marriage. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no wine. Another version of this says, the wine has failed. 
which, which I thought was an interesting wording of it. The wine, the wine has failed. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with you and me? Now there are, were six water pots of stone set there after the Jews, manner of purifying, containing two or three metrits apiece. And Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw, out, draw some out and take it to the ruler of the feast. They took it, and when the ruler of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and didn't know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew where it came from. The ruler of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when the guests have drank freely, then that which is worse, you have kept the good wine until now. You have kept the good wine until now. Now, this, this verse and this, uh, this story has always been, a, I think, in many ways, a, a mystery. Uh, and it's been a, a mystery for many in, in many ways. And, um, but there are aspects of this that really have to do with you and I, that have to do with our spiritual unfolding. But before I get into this specifically, I want to follow up a little bit with what I was talking about last week. Last week, I talked about, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the word that we're referring to here, translated, was logos. Now the word logos really implies, is really talking about, is really describing the creative energy source process that is in the beginning, which is really the first principle. It is the very first thing. There is a creative process, and that creative process is in which all things are made through which all things are made. It is a process that's in us. It's a process that is in everyone. And the first chapter of John talks about the light that is shining in everyone. And so um, we have a tendency to think that it really is simply focused on teaching about Jesus, but I'm going to suggest to you that that's exactly not what it's saying. It's saying the light that is shining in everyone, and that light in, that is shining in everyone is that Christ presence, that Christ consciousness, that awareness of our oneness, our divine essence, our aware, that awareness of the presence of the divine, creative power working through us. And then we go on to talk a little bit about John, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. The voice of one crying in the wilderness is basically saying, align yourself with that which will allow the presence of that Lord, the divine, to flow and work in and through you. And one of the ways that he helped people to really understand that and know that, and again, we're talking about characters from a time ago, but we're talking about aspects of our nature. There's an aspect of our nature that knows that there is something greater and something more within you. There's a voice inside of you that's saying there's something more. And so what we're here to do is listen to that voice, but not necessarily get caught up believing that that voice itself is the something more. And John relates that I'm not the one, but there is one that follows behind me that is the Christ, the one, the light. The light. And then he goes on to tell some of, John goes on to tell some of his followers that I'm not the one, but there is one that follows behind me that the dove will descend upon. And the dove really is symbolic of that essence of the Holy Spirit that, that comes, from a, comes from within us, that is an awareness that comes of a sense of peace, a sense of well-being, a sense of knowing, a sense of, um, yeah, a sense of lightness, and you might say. And so the dove comes down and is basically demonstrating for us that in us there's an awareness and there, that we will know that by that sense of peace. The more we can feel and experience that sense of peace and well-being, we'll know that we're in that consciousness that is more of our divine nature, which is more of that Christ. So the story goes on that John says to some of his, his disciples, this is the one. 
And so some of those disciples began to follow Jesus. Now, the disciples metaphysically represent our divine spiritual qualities. In unity, we talk about them as our 12 powers. The 12 powers are uh, different spiritual qualities that each and every one of us has, and there may be more than 12, but that's Charles Fillmore really presented that there were 12 main spiritual qualities that are in the Christ consciousness, and each and every one of us has those 12 qualities. The ones that came forward at this time, the first one was Andrew. Now, Andrew represents strength, spiritual strength. So I don't know that it, uh, I don't know that it necessarily, there are those who get really caught up in saying, well, strength, uh, you know, that these different spiritual qualities reside in certain places within the body. And I'm going to suggest to you that I don't think that's nearly as important as just how they come together as a whole and how they are working together. So I think it's really valuable for us to look at these different spiritual qualities. Uh, strength, Andrew, was the, the brother of Peter who represents faith. So these are different qualities that are being called forth from within us. So strength and faith and another one was imagination. All of these things are part of that creative process that you and I are able to tap into and participate in. And by doing this, by really aligning ourselves, by following uh, this Christ principle, these spiritual qualities become stronger and they become clearer and they become more enhanced in us. And at the same time, the more we allow ourselves to develop those and listen to our inner guidance, we are allowing ourselves to develop those spiritual qualities even more. So, <clears throat> the first miracle that Jesus performed in Scripture was changing the water into wine at the wedding of Canaan. So, he and his disciples were invited to go to a wedding. Metaphysically, a wedding has to do with the union, the marriage, coming together. And metaphysically, it's the coming together of male and female. Now, those are not necessarily sexes. Those are qualities also. It's important to recognize we're talking metaphysically here, spiritually. I'm of the opinion that male and female exist within every one of us. That is something that goes on within every one of us, that we have qualities that are of a male character and a female character, but those are just simply terms that we've used to describe certain ways of, of being, certain energy, certain consciousness, and it really doesn't have to do with sexuality. It really doesn't. Because you can have a marriage regardless. You can have a marriage of coming together, of merging of these different qualities within ourselves. And so a wedding really has to do with a celebration of our coming together, a celebration of our merging, a celebration of our life, a celebration of the creative process that works through us. So it's important to understand that we're talking metaphysically about a celebration of the divine qualities that are coming together in a way that allow us to allow something even greater than our limited self to come forward. Does that make sense? There's a great uh, a metaphysical significance to the coming together. And the th interesting thing about this that I think w was really valuable for me to look at was that, you know, Jesus was an also ran at the wedding. Do you realize that? <laughs> What's that? He was an also ran. What I mean is, uh, it says that Mary was invited to the wedding, and Jesus was as well, which I thought was pretty interesting. So metaphysically, Mary actually represents our faculty, our gift of intuition, our gift of intuition. And so when you come into life, our gift of intuition, and one of the things that really is brought into this creative process is our intuition. And so it's important to recognize then that it was actually Mary who was, in a, in a sense, she was something of a guest of honor at the wedding. And Mary, our, our intuition is really kind of there to, to guide, to run, in a sense, kind of run things. 
she was actually kind of running things at this wedding. She was kind of like the wedding coordinator, you might say. <laughs> and so the wedding coordinator notices the wine has run out. Uh-oh. <laughs> now that's not a good thing at a wedding, right? That's what they say, at least back in those days, that was certainly, you see, they need to understand that weddings in those days lasted three days. They lasted three days, and it wasn't necessarily a drunken brawl. It wasn't a big uh, uh, bacchanalia, but it was a celebration, and wine was an important part of that sacrament. It was an important part of that celebration. And the wine that was there had run out. And so Mary, the intuition, says to Jesus, now in this story, Jesus represents spiritual awareness. It represents an awareness of our divine nature. It represents an early, in many ways, it represents an early awareness of our divine nature. It's an awakening to an understanding of our essence. John the Baptist is one who is pointing to our divine nature, but the Christ, Jesus the Christ, was one who is awakening to that divine nature. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think Courtney posted something recently from Ken Wilbur about the, the mystic. Can you quote that? I mean, about the mystic being, uh, a mystic is not someone who's looking for God. It, uh, a mystic is one who recognizes that, that God is in, that we are in an atmosphere of God, that we are in an atmosphere of the divine. I'm not sure I'm saying it quite right the way Ken Wilbur did, but it's, a, it's a, an awakening awareness that it's not just something out there, that it is really a part of our, of the, we are part of this divine milieu. Paul said, basically, in God we live and move and have our being. Our very essence is of the divine. Would you read it for me? Yeah, yeah. One who is immersed in God as an atmosphere. And so Jesus in this represents an awakening immersion of God in that atmosphere, of an awakening of being. And so, so he says, the Jesus part of us says to the intuition part of us, that, that part of us that's waking up says to that intuition part of us, wait a minute, um, what is going on it's interesting how it's phrased. It says, what is there between you and I? And there's been lots of different translations of this, but the one that I think is really more, to me, more accurate and more valuable is, what is this going on between us? Which I think is kind of an interesting thought between the intuition and our awareness of our divine nature. What is there going on between our intuition and our divine nature? And Mary doesn't really, the intuition doesn't really say anything. He, the intuition just at that point says to the servants, now the servants actually are the disciples. The servants are those divine qualities. The servant says, I mean, Mary says, the intuition says to these divine qualities, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. So your intuition is telling those different qualities of faith, of strength, of love, to do and follow whatever is being directed by the Christ mind, by that awakened spiritual consciousness. And that's going on within us when we're in the creative process. Do you realize that? It's basically turning over, turning over, using our intuition to listen and turn over the decision-making process, turning over our, our faculties, our qualities, and allowing those qualities to be directed by our spiritual nature. It's at that point in the wedding that Mary really becomes not necessarily the one that's running the show anymore. At that point, she's saying, you're running the show. And so Jesus tells the disciples, go and get these these vessels. Now these vessels were used as a ritual, uh, as the guests came to the wedding, they had these pots filled with water, quite a bit of water, must have been a big wedding, 
And those were used actually as a cleansing. It was used as a ritual cleansing, but I suspect it was used as a, actually to wash people's hands. Okay. Today we wash our hands because we want to get rid of germs. Today, in those days they wanted to wash their hands to get the dust off because it was pretty dusty back in those days, but it also was a ritual cleansing to eliminate those things that were not to be brought into this special experience. Does that make sense? To release those things and to, to wash them away. So, Jesus said, take those pots, fill them with water. Fill them up with water. And then take, dip in and take some out and take it to the head of the feast. The governor of the feast, I'm saying. But basically, the governor of the feast is that part of ourself that is kind of overseeing and observing and looking at everything. And, um, and it, they take the water to the governor of the feast. The governor of the feast drinks it and said, wow, this is great. This is really good. In fact, this is better than what you were serving before. Now, wait, wait a minute, that's, that's backwards. Most people give you the best stuff first, and then when you've already, kind of your, your taste buds and your, and your senses have been dulled a bit, then they bring out the bad stuff. <laughs> but you've done the opposite. You've done the opposite. You've brought out the good stuff now. And the good stuff really is that which is been transformed by our Christ nature. Think about this symbolically also. The water itself really has to do with, I feel, it has to do with shifting our energy and our consciousness. We, we bring out these vessels, and you and I are the vessels. We bring out those vessels and we fill them with water, and the water's fine, the water's good, it's actually used for purification. And it is, it is something that is worthwhile, but at the same time, we're at a wedding. It's a feast. Life is a feast. Your life is a feast. Your life is a wedding. It's a celebration. And you have the possibility and the potential of having a wonderful, wonderful celebration. And the more we allow ourselves to let that divine voice within us direct and guide us, we will find that what is needed is provided for. What seems ordinary and normal and natural can be lifted into a higher vibration. The wine represents a higher energy, a sweeter taste of life. It represents something that is, that is a different way of seeing than the previous wine, the tre previous way of seeing. It really has to do with changing a perception, changing the way that we are visioning and seeing ourselves and, and the way that we are seeing life, the way we are looking at things. So when we allow ourselves to, when we listen to our intuition, our intuition directs us and guides us to listen to that divine nature, to that divine voice, that, that Christ presence within us. And that Christ presence within us is saying, let your life be filled with what is, and it will be transformed and lifted. I came across... Uh, some notes from one of my metaphysical teachers back in ministerial school, Ed Rabel. Ed Rabel was a magnificent metaphysical teacher. And he says, these water pots filled with water which the servants filled and bore to the ruler stand for the first stage of a new manifestation about to occur. The water is tasteless, totally fluid, and in a sense invisible, which is the symbol for potentials or a pre preview of things to come. But it is there the water is there. It is not yet the finished product that it is destined to be, but it is there. And all that you need for a completely transformed higher quality of essence of life is already there. It's already there. But in most of us, it is in the water stage of expression. The new you is here, but it is still in the water stage 
And when you diagnose manifestation expression by analysis, by, se by sequential analysis, this is only for the purpose of, of recognizing that water becomes the wine, potential then becomes the actual. And the activity of Christ, interestingly enough, he points out that Jesus didn't do anything to the water. He didn't go put his hands in it. He didn't touch it. He didn't do anything. He just simply had them fill it. And that Christ awareness made the transition. The wine represents a higher elevation of understanding and awareness. You and I are being called every moment of every day to transform water into wine, aren't we? We're being called to transform our everyday life into the wine of spiritual celebration. Your life, your life is a blessing. What are the perceptions that you are holding that can bring your life into, back into, perhaps, a knowing of the possibilities of a greater good, the possibilities of love, the possibilities of faith, the possibilities of life, the possibilities of transformation. What are we putting our focus in? What are we putting our energy in? How are we allowing our consciousness to be used to bring forth more of the light that you and I are called to share? We're continually being called to come up higher. We're continually being called, invited to the wedding you might say, we're continually being called and invited to shift our perceptions, to raise our energy, to raise our consciousness, to shift our vibration, and to live from a higher place and a higher order of being. I want to read to you from one of my favorite poets, Hafiz. And... Actually, I say that's Hafiz. I better make sure that I'm... No, this is Meister Eckhart. Thank you. Meister Eckhart. This one's called To See As God Sees. If your destiny to see is... It is your destiny to see as God sees, to know as God knows, to feel as God feels. How is this possible? How? Because divine love cannot defy its very self. Divine love will be eternally true to its own being. And its being is giving all it can at the perfect moment. And the greatest gift God can give is his, her own experience. Every object, every creature, every man, woman, and child has a soul and it is the, de the destiny of all to see as God sees, to know as God knows, to feel as God feels, to be as God is. You're created in the image and after the likeness of the most amazing creative energy and process. You are created and you are given all that is needed, all that is necessary at every moment and every day, at every time to be the light of the world. It's not only in you, it is as you, it is you. And one of the things that I came across is a story, and I'll, this is, there was an American businessman who was at the pier of a small coastal Mexican village when a small boat with just one fisherman docked. 
And inside the small boat were several large tunas. And the American complimented this uh, Mexican on the quality of the fish and asked how long it took him to catch that fish. And he said, oh, not long, only a little while. Well, the American said, well, what do you do with the rest of your day? And the Mexican said, well, I sleep. I sleep late, I fish a little, I play with my children, I take a siesta, I visit with my wife, we take a stroll in the village each evening where I sip wine and play my guitar and visit with my amigos and you know, I have a full busy life, senor. The American kind of scoffed and said, well, I have a Harvard MBA and I could help you. <laughs> You should spend more time fishing and with the proceeds buy a bigger boat. And with the proceeds from the bigger boat you could buy several boats and eventually you would have a fleet of fishing boats. Instead of selling your catch to middlemen you could sell directly to the, to the processor and eventually opening your own cannery and you can control the product and processing and distribution and and you would need to leave this small village, of course, and move to Mexico City, and, and then eventually, I'm sure, to LA, or eventually to New York, where you will be running and expanding your empire. <laughs> and the Mexican fisherman said, but, senor, how long will all this take? And the American said, probably 15 to 20 years. Well, then what would I do? He says, well, then you could retire and move to a small coastal filling, uh, fishing village where you could sleep late and fish a little and, and play with your kids and, and take a siesta with your wife and stroll into the village evenings and visit with your amigos. <laughs> I have this affirmation posted above my on my desk at home and it says, I am secure. The universe has a way of supplying me with everything I need at the time I need it. The universe has a way of supplying me with everything I need at the time I need it. It's not a not really a good idea to try and change water into wine before you need the wine. And you don't need to. The universe is always there providing for you what you need in terms of divine ideas, in terms of inspiration, in terms of spiritual guidance, in terms of health and wholeness. When we allow ourselves to turn over the direction of our thoughts, our thinking, our visioning, our perceptions to that higher spiritual nature. Well, that was my lesson for the week. That's what I'm learning. That's what I'm still learning and growing. I invite you to take some time this week to reflect on when and where and how you are changing and can change the water of your life into wine. Have a great time with it. Let's move into our meditation time. So let's take a nice deep breath. Breathe into the heart space. As you breathe in and out, be open to knowing and feeling and listening to the voice of Mary, intuition. directing the spiritual qualities of faith and imagination and strength and power, directing those to listen and follow the guidance of our Christ nature, the I Am. Listen within your own heart and mind to that I am consciousness. That which Paul calls Christ in you, your hope of glory.
And as you listen to the directions of that Christ Spirit, allow your heart and mind to see through the eyes. Through the eyes of that one that is the light of the world. The Christ, the Christ consciousness, the one presence and one power in you and in each one in our world. See your life filled and transformed. See the waters of your heart and mind, your emotions, your thoughts in alignment. Be open and receptive to the wisdom, the inspiration and guidance of spirit. To see and know a world of wholeness and peace, of healing and life. you see yourself in a situation where you feel challenged, where you feel things are, invite in a, a consciousness and awareness of asking this question, how can I see this differently? How can I experience this differently? How can I know this? from a higher place? How can I express the light? Take a nice deep breath now. Let your awareness be in this room, this time and place. And when you're ready, gently open your eyes. <laughs>